Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. It seems like we're live. Um, let me know if you need anything and I'll be here, okay? Okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're going to give it another 30 seconds, and then we are going to just dive right in. So welcome, welcome. Happy Monday. And if you don't already know me, my name is Rachel Serwitz, and I am the founder and CEO and career coach at Woken. We are excited to be back on Fishbowl. And yeah, we are chatting today about interviewing and just gonna dive in and, and make sure uh, you all feel really strong, really confident with interviewing. And um, you'll be able to ask me any question, really, uh, at the end, we'll definitely do Q&A, uh, and, and we can open it up to really any career topic at that point. Um, so I've actually got a bunch of sort of prepared questions um, from, let's call it the audience, that we've scoured across uh, from Fishbowl and other other questions, and, and we're going to read out some audience Q&A, and then we're going to answer those questions. And then if anybody in the audience also has questions, please either raise your hand to join the stage, or you can direct message me, and I'd be keeping your name anonymous that way. So that is that, and I'll quickly introduce who I am. Um, my name is Rachel. My background, I worked at Goldman Sachs and then Bridgewater, and uh, I eventually got coaching training at NYU and certified through the International Coach Federation, and I also did a tech MBA at NYU, and I've been coaching now officially for about seven years through my own company as well as others, and I've done career coaching in a really wide array of you know different types of people, different types of goals and challenges, so just a, a wide perspective with hundreds of different uh, professionals. So that is quickly me. And we're just gonna dive into interviewing like a pro. So the first question says, how do you help candidates manage anxiety during the interview process? Any tips or strategies that have worked well for you would be awesome to hear. So yes, um, this is a, a big one, right? We, we often, we show up to the interview and our, you know, subconscious and, and the, the psychological sort of natural nerves just take over. Um, it becomes the fight or flight sometimes. So what's really important there is, um, A, what do you do those few minutes prior, right? Like the five to 10 minutes before an interview, I actually have a interview meditation um, that is on my website. Um, but what do you do right before the call to get yourself like calm and centered and confident? I always say, interviewing is kind of like a light switch, right? Because we all have different versions of ourselves. We all all have different moods. But during that moment, during that conversation, you're turning on the light switch. You're saying, I'm going to be my most focused, kind of happy version of myself right now. And guess what? After the interview, you get to turn the light switch off and you can go take a nap. And it doesn't matter what you do. Um, you don't want to be fake by any means. All I'm saying is you're going to be your most focused self. So really just think about it like, a version of you, a mode that you can be in. The other way I like to think about it to sort of take the pressure off is thinking about as if you're at work and you were you were meeting with somebody who is pretty senior, like a, you know, a CEO or a VP, like you might be nervous, but if they were within your workplace, you would just again, you'd be a little more focused than usual. But you still, you know, you work there and they're meeting with you and they're probably asking you questions and they want to hear from you. So you're, you're sort of more on your toes than you would be otherwise, but you're not a totally different person, right? Um, the other thing is to drum up some memories of when you were like in flow. Really think of a memory of when you were just crushing it, a project, you were really in flow. That's the version. That's the person who's going to show up, right? That that's the version of you um, who who's showing up to that interview. Um, the other thing is is to do a little writing exercise and just 
try to remember, I think uh, sometimes our, our, our nerves take over when we feel that we need or we must land this. So you really want to do a writing exercise around, you know, I have a roof over my head and I'm safe and I have family and friends that I can lean on. Even if you're sort of feeling desperate and you're in job search mode, um, you want to remind yourself that, you know, you're, you're safe and you have support and that will help calm the nerves because you, the last thing you want is to come across like, oh, I like need this or I have to have this, right? So you kind of, you want to come across cool, calm, collected, right? Which is let them just meet you, let them focus on your work, your skills, your value, and all the good juicy stuff that, that you're going to share, um, you know, versus letting those nerves take over, right? Um, the other thing I will say is just practicing as much as humanly possible beforehand. So like, it could be every day. I mean, of course, you're going to practice in the first day or two prior to that. But really, if you're in job search, you could take five minutes a day, take one different interview question, and practice every single day. The beauty about practicing interview questions before you actually have an interview is you're going to think more about the genuine answer, right? Versus when you have an interview in front of you, you know, you, you might think, oh, what do they want to hear? And then you're just going to sound generic. So really prepare ahead of time to think of those genuine answers. The beauty of practicing out loud is the muscle memory is your body is physically going to feel more comfortable with the act of how do I answer these things? How do I speak in 60 seconds or 90 seconds or two minutes at a clip? And what does that rhythm feel like? What does that pace feel like? What does that tone feel like? You know, and, and, and how can I be concise and yet comprehensive? How do I structure my thoughts? How do I get in the rhythm of answering these interview questions? So that will become more and more uh, comfortable in your subconscious if you practice it a little bit every day. And it's not to memorize, it's just to get in the rhythm of how does this feel, right? And, and the more your body gets used to that, the more that when you have to show up that day, it's just going to feel like, you know, anything else. We want you in that moment to be focused on, oh, which story am I going to tell or which words am I best going to use to explain my story versus you know, letting the emotions take over. That that's that's not what we want. So we really need to do work ahead of time to to get yourself to the readiness point and that confidence point. Um, the next question says: During interview prep, what's enough? Due to kind time constraints and ongoing project commitments, feels like there's always things I don't know. What should I do to overcome the feeling of not knowing enough about the fund, the industry, sector insights, and the fear of the unknown? That's a great, great question. It, it depends how much time you have, and it depends what round interview it is. Um, you know, for a first round interview, most likely you're gonna be preparing pretty common answers. Um, if, if you're going after a similar type of role, many of your first round interviews might feel the same. Whereas second and third, they're gonna go deeper into your project expertise and it, it, it may get more specific based on that role, that company and that industry. So um, I would say the later into the rounds that you get, the more time you can take. Uh, but it also really depends on how much time you have. I mean, some people are doing this on top of a full-time job, other people are sitting there and you may have more time during the day. That being said, I don't think, even if you had all the time in the world, I don't think you need to sit there for a whole day and prepare for an interview. I like to plan, you know, ahead of time. You are going to research their website. And <clears throat> of course you can look, <clears throat> of course you can look at the interviewer of who's interviewing you. Um, but, you know, really the most important thing is preparing your own stories. So practicing out loud, I cannot say enough how important that is. Um, so it's hard for me to give an exact answer of like, what's enough in terms of time. Um, you know, and, and, and so I would just try to balance it with everything else that you have. You don't need to do overkill. You don't need to memorize, but you want to get comfortable. Another way to think about it is <clears throat> every bullet on the job description, you should have at least one story for. And so take over much time you need to do that. But sometimes there's just overkill, right? You don't want to sit there over preparing because then you're just going to get yourself nervous. So try to find that like happy medium of I have enough time to feel really comprehensive and sufficient and thorough of like, I get all my stories ready. I practice each story out loud once or twice. Um, 
and, and that might be sufficient. And then of course you want to prepare your questions for them. So I would have at least three to five really strong strategic questions ready for the interviewer as well. So all of that, you know, it could take two or three hours, but like if you only have 30 minutes, you can do a quick and dirty version. And if you have all day, you can take three to four hours. But honestly, I would use the rest of your day to do other things. I would look into other networking and other job applications. I wouldn't sit there putting all your eggs in the one basket. So you have to balance just over investing because you might make yourself too nervous or you might over prepare. So really ask yourself like, what feels thorough and sufficient for me? Um, and if you're researching, part of the question was asking about researching like the market. You know, as long as you're reading two or three articles about the industry, maybe some competitors and you're coming up with like one or two questions, I think that's fine. If you're generally finding that you're looking into industries that you're just not as informed about, that just might be a signal overall of like, maybe I need more upskilling. Maybe I need to just get better acquainted with this type of role or this type of industry, right? So the more you have a singular direction, the easier it's going to be to upskill. And then you won't worry about, oh, I have to learn every industry um, for every interview. You're just going to say, oh, I'm generally getting into this sector and I'm just going to learn about this one sector, um, you know, and, and that's going to make it a little easier. <clears throat> OK, the other question here says, how do you handle the stress of online interviews with more companies doing virtual interviews? I found that preparing for online interviews feels different from in-person. Aside from the usual interview prep, things like tech checks, lighting, camera angles, add extra stress. Next week, I'm having an interview. It's my first time. <clears throat> I hate video calls. I feel shocked about the interview. Can someone tell me whether I can switch off my camera during the interview because I'm very shy? Okay, so my quick answer there is no, I would not switch off your camera by any means. And even if you're very, very shy, I would just practice, like get a friend who can Zoom with you or, or whatever it is, Google Meets and do a video call um, and try to just get comfortable with it and try to take extra time figuring out your lighting, your desk setup. I actually love to do a standing interview if you're comfortable. I think it can make your voice project more and your energy a little more focused. So I actually like to stand during an interview, but I would just take extra time to get your setup ready and I would definitely have your camera on and I would just do whatever you need to do with friends and peers and mentors to get more comfortable with the video communication. Um, I realize it is weird. I mean, you're, the question is valid. Like, where do you stare at the screen to make sure you're making eye contact? I mean, I would iron out those things, like do a practice run um, or two or however many you need with friends to figure out what looks good and what feels good. Um, if you're not as used to videoing, I mean, many of us work remote these days. So if you're used to it, great. But even if you are used to it, you might have habits that you may not realize, like maybe you're looking away from the screen or, you know, whatever it may be. So, um, even if we are used to it, I would always do practice runs. Um, and, uh, this great site actually that I've been loving is called Udly.ai, Y-O-O-D-L-I.ai. And it's great because you can actually practice right then and there with a, a video camera and it will give you feedback. So if you really want that practice, that's an awesome site to take advantage of. Um, the next question says, any recommendations on interview tips for someone that continuously bombs their interviews due to nerves and not knowing what to say? I want to win for once. Um, so, I mean, this goes back to the preparation, but I think making sure you have at least one story per bullet of the job description um, at the bare minimum is a great way to make sure you're prepared and practicing out loud cannot say enough about that. And not just out loud by yourself, but have another pair of eyes and ears. It could be a peer, a mentor, a coach, whoever it may be, and have somebody really listen to you because they're going to be the ones to be able to say, oh, you know, I, I can barely hear you. You need to speak up or you're going too fast or this story didn't make any sense to me. Right. So having a fresh pair of eyes and ears. Um, but if you're continuously bombing, honestly, it's a matter of setting up mock interviews truly is is getting more practice. Um, and, and, and when you say not knowing what to say, the things I would think about is like taking your time. So when somebody asks you a question, you can actually rephrase the question just to buy time. You could say, oh, 
yeah, I'm happy to tell you about a project where I um, had to lead the team. Okay, so that was just a few seconds. And in the back of my head, I'm already thinking about which thing I wanna give them, right? So you can buy time that way. You can even say something like, oh, let me think about that for a second. And you take two or three seconds of silence and maybe you're writing with a pen and paper, but what you're really trying to think about is which story do I wanna tell right now? Or what are the key ideas I wanna include in this uh, answer. So you're just really bucketing your, your thoughts really quickly in those few seconds. Um, so try having a, a piece of paper and a pen in front of you um, and, and see if that helps. And it is okay to ask for a few seconds, right? Sure, the listener is going to sit there for three seconds in silence, but it's not that weird. They're going to say, oh, wow, what a great communicator. What a thoughtful communicator that we have on our hands here. The other thing is, you can always ask a clarifying question. If you're not sure what they're getting at, if you're not sure if they want to hear a story or more of a conceptual answer, or if you think you can interpret that question in different ways, be conversational. That's a great way to show that you are a great listener and a great communicator is making sure you're answering the right question. So these are different ways to make yourself feel more comfortable because it probably mimics a more regular conversation than you would typically, that, you know, that you typically have. Um, and it allows you to trust yourself that you can just be in the moment. I mean, this is a regular conversation. It's just with every answer, of course, you want to be comprehensive and concise to explain who you are and what you're all about. So that's hard and, and that's stressful. And that's why we're here talking about it. Um, but, um, you know, you, you know, uh, trying to tap into what do you typically do when you're in a pretty important conversation um, to, to listen as carefully and communicate as carefully as you can. Um, let's see. Um, this question says, what are some of the most common interview mistakes you see candidates make, um, or errors in general that lower their chances of moving forward? Interesting. Um, let's see. I think a lot of people don't do mock interviews. I think a lot of people don't even realize if they're not giving enough detail. I think people don't realize if their story isn't making sense, uh, to somebody who wasn't there. I think, people are probably not preparing uh, stories that are actually relevant to the job posting. Um, sometimes I think also when people ask questions, um, they are asking questions that imply that they, like that they should know the answer to. So when you say, oh, what makes for like a successful hire in this role or um, things like that, it's like, yeah, you should know because we're asking you to come in and do this job. So, uh, you know, even a question like that, you could say, here's what I think, you know, would make somebody successful in this role, but what am I missing from your perspective? Um, so you kind of want to come in and, and, you know, they should feel if, you, if you're interviewing for a marketing manager role, they should feel like they're talking to a marketing manager. Like you're in that role, you have that hat on, you're in that seat. Um, what other interview mistakes? I think it's a cop out question to say, oh, tell me about your path. Tell me about your journey you really want to think of questions that actually prove your strategic knowledge. The, the more uh, stronger your questions are, the more you're actually going to prove that you know how to do this job. So use your questions really wisely of what you ask them. And um, the other thing, and, and we're going to get to this, but the follow up after the interview is so important too. So don't just send like a thank you, like stay in touch at least once a week and really use those emails as an opportunity. Add value, reiterate your fit, reiterate your interest. Those are ways to stand out. You could send a 30, 60, 90 plan. You could send um, a video of yourself. You could send a blog you wrote. I mean, you can really get creative, but that's an amazing way to stand out is the follow-up. So don't just wait for them to answer you. Don't just assume they're ghosting you. You should go above and beyond. Now, sometimes if you have a lot of interviews, you may not be able to go above and beyond for everything. Um, but, uh, you know, for the ones where you're really gung ho about it, absolutely. You know, that that's, that's what you want to do is, is, is stand out that way. Um, I might be missing other common interview mistakes because I'm thinking like just off the top of my head right now. Um, but if other people have questions about like common mistakes that they feel that they make, please do, uh, ask those questions. Um, raise your hand. Um, what signs did you receive that made you confident you landed the job before receiving the offer or verbal offer? That's interesting. Um, I think that 
oftentimes recruiters sometimes can like be a really good advocate and they can try to help prepare you for an interview process. So I think that's always like a really positive sign. And sometimes recruiters will just give you context of like, oh yeah, they really had positive feedback. So you just want to listen to the clues of how your recruiter is talking. Um, obviously see how responsive they are. Um, what else? Um, those are probably the quick ones I can think about. Um, it's kind of hard to know, to be honest. I would say a, a lot of things are usually kept, not like to the chest, but um, unless they're answering your email, you know, it, it, you just got to take what they are saying and listen very carefully if they are giving you any context or any feedback um, about how the conversations are going. Um, but again, I would not just wait and rely on them. I would just go out of your way to show them that you are the best fit, right? So those follow-up emails to me can be super, super um, really just an opportunity. Um, this question says, what do I say for the tell me about a time a project failed when I legit don't have any examples? Wow. Well, first of all, I would be surprised if somebody genuinely did not have an example because we all have mistakes. So I think there's like a big difference between like the failure versus mistake. Um, and so I just wouldn't, get tripped up around that. Like maybe there was an issue and maybe you caught the issue, right? So maybe you never had a failure that actually wasn't resolved. Maybe every mistake was always resolved, but I still would, if they say the word fail to me, that means like your biggest kind of mistake. So I would really think about like, what was the biggest issue you ever had to sort of handle or deal with, or maybe you caused it and what did you do about it? And ideally it was resolved in the end. Um, but I would be hard pressed if like there was a professional who told me, oh, they've never made a mistake, right? It's just not, not possible. So I would really just challenge yourself to think about any potential mistake or challenge and how it got resolved. Um, yeah. So try to, um, be more open-minded, I would say with the examples that you're thinking of. Um, this person says how to handle the, tell me about yourself question. Yes, this is super common. Of course, people are always um, asking this. So the way I like to handle this question is uh, I have a framework and the framework that I use is background, strengths, direction. Um, so super quick, but background is essentially your functional areas of expertise as well as industries you've been exposed to. Strengths, what you're great at, what you're best at and direction, which is what work you're really motivated or excited to do. That does not mean what like, why are you a fit for this job in particular? It means, um, you know, what are you really looking to do next in your career? And that's a great moment where they can listen to you talk and you, you know, they'll, they'll hear in their own minds, oh yeah, wow, we have a, an opportunity that sounds kind of related to what it is they want to do. So that's a great moment to hear the click there. Um, so that's a very quick and dirty on the tell me about yourself question, but if anybody feels like practicing, I'd be happy to give you some uh, feedback if anyone wants to come up and tell me what they typically say. Uh, be my guest. We could do a little mock coaching right here and now. Um, this uh, question says, what's an acceptable weakness? How do you answer this question? So a lot of people trip up here and a lot of people try to like make this up or you know, be fake there. So yeah, I guess that, that would be another common interview uh, uh, sort of mistake is don't just force it. Like they're looking for authenticity here. They're looking for self-awareness because we all have challenges. So it's like, what is your actual weakness? Like you have to show that you actually know what trips you up. And then not just how are you working on it, but what do you do to guardrail it? so that it doesn't actually get in your way, okay? So so that's that's what you're really thinking about. And you wanna show very specific solutions. So maybe you're like, you know, oh, I'm not always the best with my time management, but the way that I get around that is, you know, for the last few uh, months, I've actually been using my digital calendar and I use time blocking and I actually use colors and I make sure to prioritize the day where I do my three most important things in the first half of the day. And that way the afternoon can be strategic projects. And I just made up that answer. But the point is by using a calendar time blocking, that's like super specific. 
That's like a method that you're showing that you use. So in, in a way, you're kind of showing that you solved it already to some extent, but you just need to show that there's like some actual practical solution, uh, tools, some, some hacks, some something, um, right? That way they can feel confident that you know how to handle yourself and you know how to like, yeah, basically make sure that your, your weaknesses don't actually affect you um, and that you've, you've learned, yeah, what, what you can do um, to, to make sure these things don't get in your way, okay? Um, the next question says, should I reach out to the hiring manager on LinkedIn after an interview or would it come off as pushy? Um, so no, it's definitely not pushy. Um, you definitely want to reach out. Ideally, it would be via email. So ideally, you have their email or you can ask the recruiter for their email address versus a LinkedIn DM. And I would really be extremely thoughtful in not just thanking them, mention something specific about the conversation, but you know, you can write two or three sentences about why you're an awesome fit um, and get specific, right? Like really add value. Um, you could send a link, send an article, send a blog, send a video, like get really creative to show your, your fit. I mean, if you genuinely are a fit, prove it and use those in your, those emails. Um, you know, and again, there's a difference between, in this case, the question is, it's more of a thank you email, right? So the thank you you're going to send within 24 hours. The follow-up is usually like a week, week or so later, if you haven't heard, and that's totally fair game, totally fair game. Um, this question says, what are some latest interview fraud techniques we should look out for? I saw some, um, live tool you can deploy while on video that will split out answers. There are classic bait and switch candidates over and overstated experiences. Um, interesting. Um, I don't exactly know what this question is saying in terms of video interview that spits out answers. Um, but in terms of, sorry, I'm trying to understand this. Um, you can deploy while on a video interview. I see that will spit out answers, um, and switch candidates and overstated experiences. So again, I would be wary if you're learning about tools that you think people are using in the moment, um, during a video interview to let's call it cheat or something, right? Personally, I would find any tool like that distracting. So if you're hearing about like hacks like that of some, any AI tool or whatever it is, um, I would just really make sure that A, they're not going to know that you're looking at anything or B, um, that you're not going to be distracted because neither of those things are going to serve you. And like 99% of the time or a hundred, you're just going to need to be in the moment. And if it's a video call, you want to show that you're in the moment, you're present, you're focused, you're listening, you're making eye contact, maybe you're taking notes. But personally, I would not use any of those other like hack type of tools. If anything, you can use them to prepare ahead of time. But I, I don't know if I would use them in the moment um, unless you're like masterfully skilled in a way that they're not going to tell. But it's really hard for anyone to do that. So I'd be pretty careful on, on using things like that. Um, and again, I think you can use those tools ahead of time. So if you have the job description, you can do as much prep as you really need to beforehand, right? Um, this question says, how are you using ChatGPT in your job search tips or ideas that have worked well for resume or interview prep or conversion rate from application to interview? Um, okay. Yes, absolutely. I love using AI, as I mentioned, um, for interview prep. So you can pop in the job posting and say, what are 50 interview questions I, th I could get based on this job description, right? Great. Um, you could even say, what are they going to be looking for in some of those answers? I mean, you can ask ChatGPT anything. That's the beauty, right? But um, just be wary, right? If you're using it for resume or even interview prep, if they're telling you what you what they want you to say, just be wary that anyone else might be reading that. I have heard stories where you know somebody sees two cover letters that are exactly the same because it was created by AI. So with interview prep, you know you can use it to give you what questions might they ask me, or here's my questions for them. How would you strengthen it? You can even just ask ChatGPT for feedback, literally for feedback. 
Um, and Udly, like I mentioned, is using AI, but it's listening to you talk. So it's actually giving you more feedback um, based on your actual verbal responses, which is even better. Um, so that's kind of how I would use it for, for interview prep. Um, you could even use it for researching, right? Can you tell me about this industry? Can you tell me about this company's competitors? I mean, truthfully, any question that you actually have, it's going to answer it. So absolutely get creative um, in how it can help you. Or you could say, look, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do for this type of interview question, right? Like have it help you brainstorm um, is, is, is another thing you could do. This person says, I've had a few unsuccessful interviews. Can anyone suggest the best tools for mock interviews to help you improve? Yeah. So Udly, I would say, is my, my latest favorite um, on, on mock interviewing. Or obviously, you can use a human, you know, mentor, peer, coach, whoever that may be. Um, this question says, how can candidates navigate applicant tracking systems to increase their chances of securing the interview? Share your strategies and tips. Um, so yeah, this is about the other side of the process of breaking in and obviously ATS, you can, you know, tailor your resume the best possible, but truly you need to be networking with humans to get your foot in the door and really rise above to the top of the pile and really stand out. So think about who do I know that works at that company? Who do I know and who do they know, right? Mutual connections, getting introductions, warm connections, alumni, or you could do cold outreach to a hiring manager or a recruiter, but really networking is the key. Um, this question says, had my top candidate for a role leave the process after he declined the technical assessment? What are your thoughts on take-home assignments and technical assessments? Yep, I think it really depends on the length of it. Um, you know, and if you're a candidate debating whether you wanna do it, you really need to look at how intense is this assignment and you could even ask them, how much time do you suggest that I spend on this? Because if, if it's a really big project, but they just want to hear how you would approach that project, then maybe it's a three to four hour thought exercise and you prepare some slides. But if it's like, go take, you know, 10 plus hours and actually fulfill this project, like, you know, you'd really need to be wary of doing that only for roles that you're, you're really gung ho about. Um, so, you know, if I were advising a company, I would say make sure uh, it's not too intense and it's not overly time intensive because it's just not right. Um, but I think it is okay to get some hands-on examples of how people work and how people think. Um, but I, I know this question is very dicey because, you know, as a candidate, we feel like we're giving free advice and it can feel like a waste of time. So I would ask them, how long do you suggest I spend on this? And then really ask yourself, is this role something I really want? How worth it is it to me? What else do I have going on in the pipeline? How relevant is the work? Is it exciting? Is it an interesting opportunity? And do I want to do this? Yes or no? Right. Um, this question says, what interview tips have worked for you? What doesn't work? Uh, best interview tips you've ever received? Yeah, um, this is a super broad question. Um, but, and I think I've alluded to some of these tips already today. Um, the other thing I would just say is, um, you know, give stories as much as possible um, and being authentic. Like, I think people just try to force it. Let me say what they're looking to hear. They need to get to know you and how you differ from other people. The other thing I will say is like, honestly, I usually say it's about 50% skills and 50% rapport. So really try to build the vibe and get to know the person and, and really get along, but also prove that you can do the job. So don't underestimate like the interpersonal element of the conversation. Um, always get the job posting. If you don't already have the job posting for whatever reason, just always make sure they email that to you. Um, and just going slow, right? Like, you, I'm a very fast talker, as you can tell, but if you slow down your pace, they're still going to listen and you're going to have a better ability to think while you speak and to be clear and to be um, comprehensive with your um, sharing of stories, right? So if you notice, I'm going a little slower right now, and that is a tool that is always on your side. So that's something to always just be aware of that you can always just simply slow down and it's a great way to make sure you feel really good um, with what you're saying, how you're saying it. Am I leaving anything out, right? So really just slow down. Um, giving stories as much as possible, we talked about that. Structured thinking. So how can you be 
comprehensive and concise at the same time. That is why interviews are hard. The way to do it is to structure your thoughts, right? So they might ask you some big, broad question, and you might just have to say, okay, well, there's a few main things I think about when, you know, say they're like, oh, how do you manage technical projects? Okay, well, there's a, there's a bunch of things I, I think about. I think about the timeline, I think about the cost, think about the stakeholders, and I think about um, whatever, the differentiating, you know, uh, the the strategy and the the product roadmap. Okay, all of a sudden, now I understand that there's like a few key high-level buckets that you consider, and then you can go into greater detail about each one of those. But again, the issue is when you're speaking in just 60, 90 seconds, how do you show your overview of all the things that are on your mind? The more that you can show that you think about all the factors that they need to know that you know, it, it will help them to trust you that you can operate independently on the job. So structure your thoughts into a few of these key buckets of like, what are the key ideas and the key themes, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that they need to hear for this question, right? Pause before you speak. Um, that's something that really we need to practice because most of us don't do that. I know that's such an overused phrase, pause before you speak, but genuinely practice during a mock interview to say like, oh, let me think about that for a second and actually take two to three seconds of silence and think, and then you can start talking. That's something we have to practice because we all think we do that. We all think we pause before we speak. We don't, right? So really, really slow it down and and practice doing that. Um, it's okay to start high level, right? If they ask you a very broad question, you could say, oh, wow, well, you know, managing a project roadmap has a lot that goes into it. Um, here are the high level things I think about. And then once you go through that, you could say, happy to go into more detail about any one of those if you'd like me to. So you want to answer it at the level at which they ask it of you, right? Um, what else? Yeah, I would not look at anything in the moment. I'd like to just be really focused. You might have a blank piece of paper. You might have your list of questions for them, but really I don't like to, um, have much else in front of me. I think it's, it's more distracting than it is helpful. Um, practice, practice, practice. We talked about that. Um, always asking clarifying questions. Um, what else? Using transition words. So if you guys don't already know the STAR method, the STAR method is how you can tell a story. So S is situation, T means task, A is action, and R is result. So when you use transition words, it can help you remember that framework. So you could say, well, you know, oh, the situation was blah, 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 the task at hand, you know, the action steps I took, and then the results that we saw. And so they may know the STAR method, but it's a very logical way for you to tell a story really chronologically in the way that it happened, but it also helps you be concise. So using those transition phrases will tell you and tell your brain where are you at in the story and what do I need to say next, right? So those transition words can help. Um... The other thing you can do before a star is uh, give a little context, because if you just dive into a story, you, you might be missing, you know, like how often have you actually done that task before, right? And so say you're giving a story about a time you managed a project. Well, guess what? Maybe you've done that for years. So instead of just saying, oh yeah, there was this one time you could say, yeah, well, um, I've managed technical projects, uh, you know, dozens of them actually for the last, you know, three years. Uh, happy to give you this this one story that comes to mind. So when you give context like that, all of a sudden they're reassured. You're giving one story, but that's not nearly the only story. Okay, so so that's that's a, that's another thing you can do. Um, and the other thing you can do at the end of the story is adding the letter L, which is learning. So how did you go forward after that story? Did you learn something a little new and different? So it's star, but it has a little bit before and a little bit after as well. Um, The things I listen for when we're doing mock interviews, right, is the length of your answer, the pace, the tone, um, the content. Uh, Is it authentic or do you need reflection? Did I believe you? I'm basically a believability monitor, right? If I'm listening for strengths or weaknesses or anything like that, It's like, does it sound real? Does it sound like you thought about this? Does it sound like you're giving me the real deal answer? And also just, did it make sense? Did I understand this story as a person who was not there? Um, 
those are some of my probably biggest tips that I have. Um, but at this point, if anybody has questions, I would love to take some. So I will check my DMs and please feel free to also raise your hand and let me know if you'd like to come to the stage. And I'm happy to open up the conversation if you have questions about job search or networking or really any career question at all, even if it's beyond interviewing. But I'm happy to open it up. I guess the last thing I'll just say is if you're really strapped for time and you're not sure what else to prepare, um, the, the core questions I would consider is why this role, why this team slash department, why this company, and why you? And also why this industry? So those are um, kind of the quick and dirty. Um, and then, of course, there's so many other common questions as well. And if anybody wants to go through like a certain type of interview question and what, what are they looking for, what are they listening for, I'm happy to do that. Um, if you guys want to bring those to the table, I mean, I'm happy to riff on those a little bit if you want me to. But again, if people have questions, please feel free to uh, let me know what would be most helpful. So I will pay attention to see if anybody's doing that. And if not, I'm happy to kind of talk about what are some common questions and what are they listening for. Um, but please do interrupt me if you have questions. Um, we talked about the tell me about yourself question. The walk me through your resume is different than the tell me about yourself question, right? So tell me about yourself is a high level overview. Um, it's a summary, right? So you may say something like, I'm a talent development professional and I've done, um, you know, performance reviews. I've done employee onboarding. I've done, you know, skill development training, uh, program management, and um, operations, right? And all of a sudden you're listing a few core areas. These are essentially skills. These are verbs of, of what it is you know how to do. So tell me about yourself. It's a summary of everything that you've really done, background, strengths, direction. Walk me through your resume. That's chronological. So that's like, where did you start out? What was your first job? What did you do? Why'd you go to the next place? Next job, one sentence. What'd you do? Why'd you go to the next place? And you keep doing that until you get to today. And you always want to end off with what are you looking to do next? So that way it brings on the conversation. It brings it back to why are we here today? You're not telling them why do you want that role? You're telling them, you know, what, what are you hoping to do in general? What, what work is motivating to you as a next step? So that's the walk me through. And you really need to practice that one because it's hard to boil down one job into one sentence, but that's really what you're doing is, oh, I, I was here. Um, and you know, here's what I did and here's why I went to the next place. Yeah, Bruno, you can, um, come up, um, and tell me your question. Yep. Um, I can't hear you yet, Bruno. Let's see. Um, let me know if your sound is sort of working or if, uh, ah, yeah, you hear me now? Shoot. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, so um, I was just wondering, when we have very broad experiences um, over the course of our career, um, our jobs have had very, um, you know, broad requirements. How do we position that when we're having an interview for a position that has a more narrow scope, right? It's not, it's not quite a career transition in that the narrow scope is within the broad, you know, responsibilities mm -hmm. that you had previously but it was just a part of it. So, so how do we position that when you're speaking to an interviewer? Um, well, you would want to prepare stories the best that you can that relate to that specific scope. So again, I would literally read the job posting and all the bullets in the job description um, need at least one story. So for you, you're probably going to pick examples within your broad experience that relate most closely to the the scope the narrow scope of that role so you're just trying to dig up as many examples as humanly possible that you may have but maybe what you're telling me is because i've done so many things maybe i only did that specific thing once or twice so you know you, you might need to kind of reuse the same story a little bit or um just expand your memory to all the minutiae and all the details so that you remember what you did, even if you only worked on that thing once or twice. Um, and then you want to do a little research to understand 
Like, okay, maybe it's been a while. Maybe I need to dig up like how I would work on that project. Or you can think of other stories that are similar. Um, you know, there's um, some thoughts that I have about, and I can actually pull this up right now. Like, how would you answer questions that are, you know, similar to what you've done, but not exact? And so um, you want to think of stories where you can say, oh, you know, here's what I've done, um, you know, that uh, is, is similar. But in your example, here's uh, what I would do differently. So you're giving the relevant story the best that you can. And then you're saying, you know, um, you, you understand how it varies from their instance. But yeah, you're digging up as many memories, as many stories as you can. And you might even just add a little research to make sure you have the latest jargon in that arena. Um, I wouldn't ever say like, oh no, I haven't done that. I would just dive into what it is you do know. So just like always explain what's relevant. And then if there's something you would need to learn, you could say, here's how I would learn A, B, and C, or I'm already learning this, here's how I'm learning it, or here's what I understand to be true about this type of process. Um, just showing your understanding conceptually of things goes a pretty long way, but as much as you can tell stories um, is, is really ideal. Um, and I just wouldn't harp on, like the rest of your generalist background, like adds value in certain ways. And maybe that could plug into the conversation um, in, uh, you know, in a way that um, feels additive in the sense of like, oh, you have a wider perspective or you understand how to work with these different stakeholders because you've done that before. So great. Maybe your, your, your purview can add in, but really try to put yourself in the headspace of that specialized role. Right. And if you've never done it, the other thing you can do is also just network with people who are in that specialized role, because that networking is going to give you, oh, what is their headspace? What is their focus? What is their week all about? What is their metrics? What is their goals? What were their challenges? What is their jargon? What are their technologies? Right. So like just network with people in that space um, to really understand it deeply. And, and by the way, this goes for anybody. If you're pursuing a space, you want to be networking and just learning super deeply. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the quick thing I would think about Bruno. Um, but really ask yourself, like if there's gaps in your knowledge and you know, you can, you can do some research, but yeah, it's sort of a dicey one to try to always lead with the positives of what you have done and what you do know, and not make it as obvious that you're just like filling the gaps or learning, but really you just want to drum up your memory as much as humanly possible for as many stories that are relevant, um, you know, and, and, and just go deep. Like maybe you only had one or two examples, but try to remember every little detail about those projects so that you can tell those stories really, really, really well. I hope that That's helps. great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other questions. And always ask for feedback, by the way. If anybody does get a rejection, I know getting feedback is not always common, but you can um, email them and just ask for a five minute phone call and just make it really genuine and say, if you have any time to spare, like, let me put it this way. If you've had two rounds or three rounds and they spent a lot of time with you, they're gonna ideally be more willing and likely to give you that feedback. If it was just a one round, they may not have time to do so. But if they've spent a few rounds with you and you got the rejection, I would really try to be genuine with your email and just say, for my future learning, for my path forward, I'd be so grateful for any uh, thoughts you're willing to share from the team, um, if there's anything I can consider moving forward, and just show that you're really open to that um, for your own path, your own learning. So really try to get that feedback as much as you can, um, and just reflect on what you think you could have done better as much as you could be aware of that. Um, ways of standing out, we talked that, we talked about that. Um, sending thank you notes, of course, follow-ups, we've talked about that. Um, anything I miss, anything anybody wants to um, hear more about? Yes. Sevilla. Your question. Hi. Hi. Uh, first off, thanks for doing this. So far, it's been great, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, again, sorry if you've already 
talked about this, but I feel like even if you did, I didn't get enough. So I'm going to go ahead and ask in the tell me about yourself question. They've heard like, especially candidates for the same role. They've heard the same thing over and over again. I've done this. I've had these accomplishments. I have the appropriate amount of years and experience to be a candidate for this role. So how do I change that up without getting too personal? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I wouldn't actually assume that they're hearing the same thing in the tell me about yourself from everyone. Um, I think everybody answers that question pretty differently. And I think your differentiator is actually being really clear and really structured. So the background strengths and direction framework, by the way, is not something that everybody's going to use. So you could even help them understand you to say, well, my background is in da, 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 da. my strengths are blah, 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 blah. In terms of my path forward, I'm really excited about da, 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 da. So give those, um, you know, uh, introductory phrases that shows them the structure of what ideas you're sharing, because everybody does give a bit of a different tell me about yourself framework. Um, and then I would just take really good care to um, think through it. Like that second sentence, the strengths, to me, that's the opportunity to be pretty unique is what are you amazing at? And like, why are you so great at it? Like, why are you awesome at this role? Like, that's really where you can be pretty authentic um, and just like really try to avoid, you know, generic stuff, because that's where everybody's like, I'm a great problem solver. I'm a great communicator. Like, tell me more. What problems? What communication? What are you amazing at? Like, really work on that second piece so that it's super, super, super authentic. And then the first sentence about your background, like, it's okay to sort of say obvious things. I mean, if you're an obvious fit, I wouldn't just like, try to change it up. Like, I, I think it's good to be an obvious fit, right? If you're like, if they're looking for a talent development professional, and you say, I've done you know, employee performance reviews, promotion cycles, um, and onboarding and whatever else, LMS systems. And it's like, those are the requirements of the job. Great. That's awesome. Right? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, sometimes you can throw in a little bonus if you've worked at some brand name companies, or maybe you had a reputable client or, or, you know, you could throw in a little mini, you, you don't want to tell a whole story, but maybe you could say in particular, I supported, you know, a thousand employees, or like maybe you throw in a quick metric to show the depth of, of what you've done and the breadth of what you've done. Um, but I think it's okay, like to be specific and say, I've done A, B, C, D, E, and F for however many years. And at these companies for these, and I supported this many clients or this many employees, like you show the depth to it. If you're saying things, um, that are aligned, um, just remember this question is an icebreaker, right? It, it's the basics. And so, I personally think if you're if your overview and your background is aligned, like that's the green light to move forward. If you're being too differentiated, maybe they're just gonna be confused and be like, why are we here? Like, don't like just skip over obvious stuff assuming that they remember your resume because they don't. So I, I would I would be straightforward. I think the second sentence is where you can be really unique. Like maybe like really reflect why are you amazing at this job? What traits? what do you do that goes above and beyond? What do you do that's so unique? Maybe you have a unique perspective that makes you really awesome at this or, or whatever it may be. So that second sentence I think is where you can stand out, but to just do that icebreaker of, of, of what your core areas of expertise are, um, I think you'd kind of want to use the jargon that they want to hear. And, and that's probably the one time to do it because then what's going to happen the rest of the conversation is you're going to tell stories that are unique to you. So then they're going to drill deeper and try to have you prove your experience. And the stories are going to be super unique to you, your past roles, the past companies, the past projects, what it is you did, how did you do it? What was the depth? What was the breadth of it? Um, you know, was it a smaller scope, a bigger scope? How successful were you? I mean, the stories is where it's the show versus tell, um, you know, and so the, the icebreaker moment, like, I think you want to be relatively sort of straightforward because that's their moment to be like, oh, great. You've done all the things I need you to do. Perfect. I mean, we are in a job market where people want kind of those core areas of expertise. They want the obvious hire. They want the obvious fit. So I do hear what you're saying, but I just wouldn't go too, you know, cheeky with it. Um, I think that second sentence, you can get creative. And then guess what? If you want to add something at the end about your personal they said, tell me about yourself. Guess what? You can also show who you are. You could say, 
you know, on the side, I love to play pickleball and I am like a jazz singer or like whatever. I mean, you know, and, and maybe that's cool and fun and unique and different. And guess what? That's also like, we're human. Like they want to hear like weird, fun facts, you know, you don't have to do it for 10 minutes, but like, maybe there's a fun fact you add to the, to the mix. And all of a sudden, guess what? They're going to remember you because it's like, that's weird. Oh, you collect, um, like weird, whatever, random, I don't know, you know, like tell them something unique. Um, that that's another way to stand out. But I think the tell me about yourself needs to feel like it hits home. Like, why are we in this conversation? Make it make sense for me. You know, that's my quick thoughts on that. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, that was fantastic, Rachel. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from our audience? Or feel free to DM me as well. And I'll hang out for another minute or two. Um, and if not, um, please do keep our website handy. We have a ton of free resources on there, including... Um, we have a reflection guide for after an interview rejection and how, what to reflect on um, and a bunch of other downloadable templates. And, uh, um, our website is IamWoken.com. We always offer a free one-on-one -on -one chat. So if you're really looking to hear you know, thoughts about how you're doing and, and what you can be doing sort of better and differently, we're happy to set up a time and, and chat with you. And, and we're always back on Fishbowl as well. Um, so please do keep in touch, um, You know, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, usually on social, we are either at Woken or at Get Woken, but on LinkedIn, you can just find me by my name. Um, and please DM me, tell me how you're, how you're doing and I'm happy to help. And yeah, if anyone has another question, please let me know. I'm happy to hang out for another minute or two here and answer anything that I can. And if not, I'll give you guys a few minutes back. But uh, thank you so much for joining. And again, please do stay. And, uh, we'll be back in a few weeks in December with, with some more stuff. And please do find me. And um, I'm here to help. And um, just know that interviews take practice. It really, really does. It deserves that time. The more you practice, the better you'll get. You're not there to memorize. You're there to just build readiness, comfort, and confidence with how to go about the process. And just practice out loud. Really, really have somebody there to listen and uh, support you through it. And uh, we'll be back and hopefully I'll see you all again.